All right, gang, here we go. This is for Chem 1, Unit 9, Part 6, talking about water. Yeah! All right, so in order to understand why water is special, we have to think back to its structure. And we have to think about intermolecular forces. So remember when we used to draw water, we always drew it like this. There's two hydrogens attached to one oxygen. And remember how the oxygen has two lone pairs sticking on it. And because of that, we showed that this guy was polar, right? It had one end that was positive. Those are the hydrogens. Remember this delta positive sign had a net positive charge. And then where the lone pairs are, Remember, you got these big old electron clouds that are sticking out in here. It's got a net negative charge, and here's our delta negative. And because of this, water is polar, and then it's kind of like a little magnet, okay? And because it's a little magnet, it'll attract other things that are little magnets. And because of that, lots of things will be able to be dissolved by water. And because of that, we call it the universal solvent. All right, and we'll talk more about exactly how that occurs in a future unit. But for now, you just need to know that water can dissolve things because things want to stick to water because water is polar. All right, And so it's all because of these net positive and negative charges. Now, the other thing that's special about water is it's got these two hydrogens. If you think about your intermolecular forces, remember we talked about these a while ago now. We talked about intermolecular forces. We had, uh, we had London dispersion forces, London dispersion, and we had uh, dipole forces and then finally we had hydrogen bonding remember the hydrogen bonding uh, could only occur if we had fluorine oxygen or nitrogen with hydrogens attached all right so in this case remember water has hydrogen bonding capabilities because it's got a hydrogen attached to oxygen right and remember we talked about how hydrogen bonding fon spells fun right so we have hydrogens attached to oxygens here, and we so we get this fun uh, with hydrogen bonding attached. Now, because of the hydrogen bonding, all right, and because of the polarity, water has really unique properties. Okay, so water likes to stick together with one another because of the hydrogen bonding. Notice that we get hydrogen bonding occurring. Notice that it has a lot of opportunities to hydrogen bond. A hydrogen bond can occur here and here and here and here. Okay, and then this is just a little diagram is reminding you that hydrogen bonds and covalent bonds are not the same. We call them hydrogen bonds because they're so much stronger than other intermolecular forces, but really they're quite weak compared to other compared to actual chemical bonds. All right, uh, so. We get this structure, and we'll talk about this here in a couple of minutes, but I would just want you to notice these hexagonal shapes that it makes. This is very important. So there's a, several unique water properties that we're going to talk about, and all of these occur because water is both polar and can form a lot of hydrogen bonds. All right, so those are the two main reasons why water is very unique, because it's polar and it has uh, lots of capabilities for hydrogen bonds. All right. So the first one here is as it has high surface tension, okay? And, and the surface tension is caused by intermolecular forces. These hydrogen bonds like to, st or these water molecules like to stick together. And so here we've got a picture of this spider that's sitting on top of this water. And you can actually see here that this water is being pushed down by the feet of the spider. And probably the spider has lots of little hairs that kind of spread out its weight but regardless, it's sitting here on the water, and this it's not sinking into the water because the surface tension. It's so it's essentially walking on it. This is a Jesus lizard fish. You've probably seen uh, these guys before. Type into Google is a Jesus lizard or Jesus fish or don't, why am I saying fish? It's a Jesus lizard, Jesus Christ lizard. Okay, and they can actually run on water. These like fairly big geckos, lizard things, can actually run on the water. They look super goofy while they do it, so it's well worth watching just for the grins. But anyway, uh, so they can actually run on water, and it's because these water molecules uh, across the surface of your liquid, these water molecules, all right, are sticking together by these hydrogen bonds, right? And this is, this is kind of a stupid way to look at it because these are actually bent, but whatever. And so you get these hydrogen bonds and they're sticking together. So it takes a certain amount of force to break them apart from one another. And uh, those this force that you have to break is their intermolecular forces. The other thing that's, or another thing that's interesting about water is it has high specific heat. Specific heat is defined as the heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance one degree. So if you want to raise the temperature of water one degree, Okay, it takes a specific amount of heat, and that amount of heat uh, has to do with the intermolecular forces that it has. Okay, so water has a really, really high specific heat. That's why we can use water uh, for cooling properties. So we use water to help us cool our engines, uh, nuclear power plants. Uh, you know, if you go swimming in the, you know, in the summertime, the water is at a lot lower temperature than the pavement right next to it, or. Um, 
because it has a lot higher specific heat. Okay, it's at a much lower temperature because it has a lot more energy, or it takes a lot more energy to raise that temperature. Okay, and so because of that, uh, it makes it really nice for like this little fish here. If the water didn't have a high specific heat, this fish would uh, probably not be able to survive because this water would fluctuate in temperature a lot more. But because of the high specific heat, the water is able to withstand or not freeze or freeze or uh, not boil, you know, not vaporize. Okay, so high specific heat, high surface tension. Another one here is it's got low vapor pressure, all right? So low vapor pressure, uh, remember vapor pressure is the pressure exerted by a liquid's vapor above it, okay? And so it, remember if we have, uh, so we've drawn this curve a couple of times. If we have, you know, the number of molecules, specifically we're talking about water here, molecules, and then this is the energy, kinetic energy specifically. So remember we had some curve that does this number here. And so this is the spread out of the kinetic energy for our molecules. In order to boil or in order to evaporate, we have to be above some generic line. And we don't quite know what that is. It just depends on what you're looking at. Now water's uh, vapor pressure, the amount of energy it takes uh, is really high up here on the right. It takes a lot of kinetic energy to break free of those intermolecular forces. Because of that, very few water molecules uh, in a given sample will have enough energy to break free so it has a low vapor pressure as opposed to other things that have a much lower vapor pressure they'll be able to or a much higher vapor pressure they have a much lower intermolecular forces okay so the the lower the intermolecular force the higher the vapor pressure is going to be but because water has much higher vapor pressure or much higher intermolecular forces its vapor pressure is much lower and this goes ha hand in hand with the heat of vaporization uh, the heat of vaporization is essentially a fancy way of saying how much energy do you need to put in to make something boil all right and so because remember boiling we talked about this in the last video or two videos ago now uh, boiling is happens when your vapor pressure okay when your vapor pressure is equal to your atmospheric pressure vapor pressure is equal to your atmospheric pressure so if your vapor pressure is generally very very low okay because if you have a lot of intermolecular forces like water does then your atmosphere then you have to get to a much higher vapor pressure or you have to add in a lot more heat in order to get it uh, to equal the atmospheric pressure and so therefore you need a lot higher uh, amount of heat in order to get it to vaporize all right so those are the those are another two properties of water you need to know low vapor pressure and high heat of vaporization uh, last little thing here this should be pretty easy okay ice is less dense than liquid water the hydrogen bonds so we remember when you um, when you go from liquid to solid it's an exothermic process that energy is leaving your liquid and what's left is water molecules with less kinetic energy so it has to arrange itself in a lot lower energy state and so those intermolecular forces have a lot more strength holding those molecules together so those hydrogen bonds take precedence into the shape of the water molecules and because of this um, it becomes much more open because they're going to arrange themselves as in a honeycomb and ice has holes in its structure so we can look at this guy here this is crystalline water okay and notice that we get this honeycomb shape we get these six-sided figures where these water molecules have have these holes there's nothing here whereas in liquid water uh, these guys would be much much closer to one another all right um, so because of this, because it has holes in it, it makes it less dense. And so that's why ice floats, because ice is less dense, it, it's things aren't as close together. And because of that, uh, the ice will float on the liquid water. Okay. It also explains why water expands all right, uh, as it freezes, is because it's literally taking up more space for the same number of molecules. All right. So here's another example here. We've got this hexagonal shape of these water molecules of this ice, right? And this is a three-dimensional look so that it, they kind of look kind of uh, squashed together and stuff. So you kind of have to like squint your eyes and look at it funny. Whereas liquid water molecules here, uh, they constantly break and reform with one another. And generally they're cubic shaped. And because of that, they're a lot closer together, a lot, le a lot more dense, okay? Uh, last little thing here, water of hydration. Okay, if a substance removes water from the from the environment, it's called hygroscopic. All right, hygroscopic. So these are things like uh, if you've ever bought a new pair of shoes or electronics, they'll come with like a little uh, package there called silica beads or something like that, and they say very clearly, do not ingest or do not eat. Okay, do not do that. But those things are hygroscopic. They're really good at pull pulling water out of the environment. Okay, if they're in some sort of air, especially sealed container, they're really good at absorbing things. 
uh, like if you've ever changed a diaper of a baby, okay, the, the, the stuff in the diaper that absorbs the urine or is, is a hygroscopic compound. It absorbs the water, okay, and so um, essentially, and so there's two different types of hygroscopic molecules that I want you to know. There are desiccants, okay, um, and these are essentially hygroscopic uh, substances that remove water from the atmosphere to keep the environment dry. And these are examples that I always already gave you. So we put them in medicines, shoes, electronics, just to keep whatever it's in dry. All right. So I've got a 3D printer in order to keep my filament dry. I have to. I have like a, a bunch of desiccants in there that I've stolen from electronics that I've bought. Okay. And so it keeps my filament dry, so it'll keep working next time I need to use that specific color type. All right. The next kind is a deliquescent. Okay, and these guys are super strong uh, hygroscopic molecules that actually remove so much water from the air that it turns into a solution itself. So uh, like sodium hydroxide comes in little pellets when you buy it. And sodium hydroxide is a deliquescent. So uh, probably in class, I'll take like a little container. I'll put a couple pellets of sodium hydroxide out. And over the course of a day or two, you'll actually see it turn from solids into uh, a mush liquid. And then it'll eventually turn into a solution. And the water that it got in order to make itself a solution it actually stole from the air around it. All right, so these are called this water of hydration. Hygroscopic molecules is the main, uh, the main uh, name of them, right? And then the two types are desiccants and deliquescence. And that's it for the unit. Congratulations, you made it through unit nine. I'm so proud of you. Uh, do practice problems. Let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you on the flip side.